Hello and welcome to the Colson Academy's revision lesson for Nazi Germany. Now we've decided to break this down into three different sections as the Nazi Germany section of the course is quite large. So you'll see that we've got three different videos, each will be on the YouTube playlist. But today you only need to know about part one. So today we're going to be looking at how Hitler became a dictator and we're going to think about how he remained in control for the next 12 years. Next time we'll think about Nazi social policies and the time after that we'll think about opposition economic policies and the impact of World War II. This is the pack which you might have already downloaded from Show My Homework. Remember if you've got a printer you can highlight rather than writing all these notes down. Remember that this is just the basic information that everybody needs to know. I'll talk about additional things and it's always a good idea to add the extra information round the outsides if you can. Let's make a start on it. OK, so first of all, we need to know about the background to Nazi Germany. Now, in the end of the Weimar video, we have thought about um, Hitler becoming Chancellor, which he does on the 30th of January 1933. And there are lots of different reasons that you need to know about for why people voted for the Nazis. And we can see them listed below. Remember, if you want to go back over this in detail, you can get your Weimar knowledge packs out and it has loads of information on these different factors. But essentially, remember that the Great Depression had made the German people desperate. Six million people were unemployed and Hitler had promised work and bread. We know the Great Depression was incredibly important in getting the Nazis to power because before the Great Depression in 1928, they only had 2.6 percent of the vote. But by the time the Great Depression hits in 1932, they end up having 37 percent of the vote. So it was incredibly significant. It wasn't just the depression itself, but it's the way that Nazis used their propaganda and made people feel like they were the only hope for Germany and that Hitler could save them. The second reason was about the weaknesses of the Weimar government, which is much more of a long term factor. And that's because the people hadn't liked the government since it was formed. Its very first action two days after it was created was to sign the armistice and therefore Weimar Germany was always associated with the bitterness of the armistice and people were always seen as the November criminals. The third reason there about fear of communism is the Great Depression had also increased support for the communists and lots of people were very scared of the communist takeover. Therefore, lots of rich businessmen, including people like Henry Ford, gave the Nazis lots of money, which they then used for their propaganda. You can see the fourth one there is about a strong party organisation, including strong electioneering. For instance, the Nazis used planes to fly Hitler around and he was able to give speeches all across Germany and make the German people feel like he cared about all of them and in all the different regions. The final one there is Hitler's personal qualities. Remember that people saw him as a war hero, somebody that was loyally German, and he was very charismatic and able to convince most people that he cared about them and their cause. So that's the background of why people voted for the Nazis. Now, Hitler gets chosen on the 30th of January 1933 to be Chancellor. And remember, it is the president that gets to choose who that's going to be. And in this case, President Hindenburg decided to let Hitler be Chancellor because He'd attempted everything else and nothing seemed to be working. Hindenburg didn't like Hitler as an individual. He didn't think that he was somebody that should be chancellor. But since 1930, Germany had been ruled using Article 48. No government had a majority and therefore no laws could get passed through the Reichstag. So out of desperation, Hindenburg decided to finally let Hitler be chancellor on the 30th of January they had mistakenly believed that they would be able to control the politically inexperienced Hitler. They thought they could box him in and make him squeak like a mouse, according to somebody called Papen. However, we know that's not the reality. And within a year and a half, Hitler had gone from being the chancellor to the dictator of Germany. And we're gonna look at those steps next. So now we're gonna think about the first key area, how Germany becomes a dictatorship by August, 1934. And we've already mentioned that Hitler was chosen to be Chancellor on the 30th of January 1933. Remember, it's the president that chooses the Chancellor. And it is an important position because it meant that he was in charge of day to day government. But ultimately, he could be removed at any point by President Hindenburg or the army, which again is controlled by the president. 
So Hitler was in a good position. He was the second most powerful man in Germany, but he could still be removed at any point. And therefore, he got to work immediately in trying to establish a dictatorship. Some of this was down to skill and some of this was down to luck. So we're going to talk through each of the events now. It's important that you understand what happened in each event, but also that you can explain why this step helped him become a dictator. And we'll talk through it as we um, as we go through. So first of all, the first event we need to know about happens on the 27th of February 1933, and that is the Reichstag fire. Now, the Reichstag, the German Parliament building, is set alight a week before the elections are scheduled to take place on the 5th of March. Now, they find a young Dutch communist, a man called van der Lubbe, who's found at the scene. And the Nazis use this to their advantage. They then say this is part of a wider communist plot to try and start a communist revolution. And they do this because it's very clever. And it means that ordinary middle class people, people that wouldn't necessarily have voted for the quite extreme Nazi party, decide that they would rather have the Nazis than the communists. And therefore, it increases their vote at the March elections. So the Reichstag fire is a really important event to know about, an event that caused real terror. But actually, the consequences after are even more important. If you were ever writing about the Reichstag fire, you would always link it to the emergency powers. And I would never deal with them separately because they are very much linked together. The day after the Reichstag fire, Hitler convinced Hindenburg that because of the fire, he should be granted emergency powers, more powers than any other chancellor has ever been given before. And he's able to use this suspend civil rights. Before this, the German people had lots of rights that were protected under law, for instance, freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. This then takes that away. So before, to be arrested, they would have to have evidence against you in order to be able to keep you imprisoned. Now, Hitler doesn't need that anymore. He can put anybody in preventive custody. And that is what he does. He ends up arresting 4,000 people within a couple of weeks, including most of the communist leaders, most of the opposition that he's trying to get rid of before the elections are held less than a week later. He also uses it to ban all communist propaganda. So this is an incredibly important step because he takes away the rights of the people and those rights remain taken away for the whole time the Nazis are in power. So this is a really crucial event. And most historians think it was actually the Nazis that either set it or certainly they were aware and decided to let it happen. so They could use it to their advantage. But then we need to think about the March elections next. Hitler was really hoping to get an overall majority, especially with so many people scared about the attempted revolution back in February. Now, last time that there was an election, he hadn't got the majority he wanted because a majority is more than 50 percent and would allow him to control the Reichstag. Think back to July 1932. They had 37 percent of the vote or 230 seats. In this election, he does gain some more. but He only gets 44 percent of the vote. So he hasn't got enough to control the Reichstag on his own. So he then does a deal and forms a coalition with the Nationalist Party. DNVP. And this then allows him to control the Reichstag because they have more than 50% of the Reichstag politicians supporting them. So that's really crucial because then it allows Hitler to pass the Enabling Act. So you can see all of these steps are important on their own. But there's also some really strong links between them. Now, the Enabling Act is an absolutely crucial step. Most historians argue this is the legal basis for Hitler's dictatorship. It's almost like being a magic genie and the first wish you get, you decide to wish for more wishes, unlimited wishes. It's basically that in law. So Hitler proposes a law that gives him the power to pass laws for four years without having to consult the Reichstag. So he can pass whatever he wants without having to go through Parliament. And he uses this to his advantage. For instance, we'll talk about it later, but in July 1933, he uses it to ban all other political parties. 
Later on, when Hindenburg dies in August 1934, he passes a law that says somebody can be both chancellor and president, which before nobody could. So this is a really key act to understand, the Enabling Act. It is different to the emergency powers, and it's important that you know the difference between them, because there's a lot of people that get very mixed up. But the emergency powers take away civil rights. The Enabling Act allows him to pass whatever laws he wants for four years. So this is absolutely crucial. And the only party that said no to this were the SPD. All the other political parties in Germany agreed to it. The communists didn't get a vote because they'd all been arrested by that point. But still, most people supported this in law. Then in April 1933, Hitler establishes the Gestapo, the secret state police, under somebody called Heydrich that we'll come back to later. Then also establish the first concentration camp at Dachau, and so Nazi terror begins. Think about the next phase of dictatorship. We've mentioned already about the Enabling Act. One of the things that they did use in the Enabling Act was to ban trade unions. And this helped Hitler to secure some more money from some business owners. Now remember, lots of rich businessmen had helped fund Nazi propaganda because they were scared of communism, but also because Hitler promised when he came to power, he would help them out. Now big business owners, factory owners, they didn't like trade unions because trade unions campaign for better rights for workers and better wages. So they wanted them gone. And Hitler, to pay them back for all the propaganda that they funded, decides to ban all trade unions using the Enabling Act in May 1933. And he replaces it with something called the German Labour Front, the DAF. It's actually not really a trade union, because it doesn't actually support the workers. But it's good for Hitler, because now he's paying back those industrialists who have paid for his propaganda, and he's gonna be asking them for a favor. He's going to want some more money in the future for rearmament. So it's definitely a case of this being mutually beneficial for the Nazis and the rich people, the industrialists. Also using the Enabling Act that we've mentioned already is Hitler bans other political parties this is a great way of him being a dictator and being able to get rid of all opposition. So he bans all other political parties except the Nazis. And it means that even when they hold elections in the future, people can't vote for anybody else so the Nazis will remain in power. Anybody that refused to accept this could now be put in one of the new concentration camps that have been formed since March 1933. Hitler then does one other thing in 1933. He's been very busy since January of that year. And he makes a deal called the Concordat with the Catholic Church. So he makes an agreement with the Pope that he will leave the Catholic Church and their youth organisations and their schools alone as long as the church stays out of politics and allows the Nazis to do what they want. So here, the Catholic Church compromised with the Nazis try and retain their independence and their autonomy when it came to their youth groups. So by the end of 1933, Hitler has been incredibly busy making himself in an even stronger position than he was when he first became Chancellor. He's now had things like the Enabling Act passed and he's now in a much better position than he was before. So things go quiet for a little while. And you can see the last few events happen in 1934 and we have something called the Night of the Long Knives and also the death of Hindenburg. So in 1934 the SA are starting to cause some problems. They have become now an embarrassment for Hitler. Remember that the SA have been around as part of the Nazi party unofficially since 1920 and they were officially formed in 1921. They've been loyal since the beginning. They were part of things like the Munich Putsch in November 1923. They are people that are supporters of the Nazi party itself. But since 1925, Hitler's also had the SS, the black shirts. And these people aren't necessarily loyal to the party, but they're actually personally loyal to Hitler. They started being his bodyguards, whereas the SA, the brown shirts, the stormtroopers, 
they started off with being the guards for the Nazi party in general. So there's a slight difference between them. Now, Hitler had liked the SA for a long time. He'd liked their kind of thug tactics. He would liked the fact that they used to beat up the communists and protect the Nazi party meetings from opposition. But they have basically done everything they can to help him. They've helped him get to power. And now that he's actually in a position of power, now he's a credible politician and he's chancellor, he doesn't really need them anymore. They're a bit of an embarrassment to him now because they're difficult to control and they're still going round in the streets and beating up people. So Hitler decides that he's got to do something about them. Another reason that he wants to do something about them is because of their leader, Rom. Now, Rom has been somebody that's been loyal to Hitler since the beginning. But Rom is going round upsetting the army. And remember, the army is one of the key groups that could remove Hitler from power if they wanted to. Rom's upsetting them because he's suggesting that the SA and the army should merge and Rom should be the new leader. And obviously, the army leadership don't like the idea of losing their position of power. So Hitler's got a choice to make. He's got to choose between the army, who could remove him at any time, and the SA, people that have been loyal to him since the beginning. And he decides to choose the army. Over two nights, 400 people are murdered. 200 of them are members of the SA. And they are murdered by Hitler's SS. So here we have Nazis murdering Nazis. And this act is really important in helping Hitler become dictator because it wins over the army. The army who hadn't particularly liked Hitler before now see Hitler as somebody that is on their side, somebody that's willing to pick them over all else. And they like that. And for Hitler, it's very good timing because just over a month later, Hindenburg dies of natural causes. He's a very old man in his late 80s by this point. And Hitler now that he's won over the army, gets them to swear an oath of loyalty to him personally. Before they used to swear an oath of loyalty to the country, and now they're swearing an oath to their Fuhrer. Hitler then uses the Enabling Act to pass a law that says he can be both Chancellor and President, and he becomes the Supreme Leader or the Fuhrer. So Hitler in a year and a half, down to both luck and skill, has managed to go from the second most powerful man who was still in quite a precarious position to being the most powerful man in Germany and taking over as dictator. So remember, a dictator is somebody that you can't remove easily from power. And there is no legal way of removing Hitler from his position by August 1934. There's no more political parties and there's no free elections anymore. So Hitler is absolutely in power for the long haul. So make sure you know about those events. You now know about all the different events for dictatorship. It's worth bearing in mind that it's always a good idea to try and categorise this. Just in case they ask you an 8 or 12 mark question on it, you might want to know about the different themes and the different ways that Hitler became dictator. So we need to know about which methods were legal. We need to know about which methods involved terror and which methods involved compromise. I'm going to go through and talk about each of them and then I want you to make a decision about to what extent would you say Hitler became dictator because of legal methods or was it mainly terror or was it mainly his policy of compromise. So first of all, if we're thinking about the Reichstag fire, it's absolutely an event that involves terror. This was something where he scared ordinary people into voting for him using the communist threat. Next one which is about the emergency powers, is very much about him using legal methods, him using that to his advantage to suspend civil rights. The next one is also about legal methods as well, the March elections. And the next one as well, Enabling Act, is also about legal methods. Now, as much as legal methods are important, historians talk about it being pseudo-legal, being the air of legality, even though in reality it wasn't really legal. So, for instance, if we think about the Enabling Act as an example, yes, it's a law that he passes and therefore it would be legal. But there's also an aspect of terror about this because 
before the politicians voted, what the Nazis did is made them walk down a hall where lots of brown shirts, the SA, were standing there with their guns, intimidating people. So there's an element of terror there as well. The next one about the Gestapo is that's another example of terror. Hitler banning the trade unions is a legal method. Him banning political parties is a legal method. But obviously, again, the fact that he's arresting people that refuse to do what they're told and putting them in concentration camps, that's an element of terror as well. And we get compromise with the Concordat, where Hitler is doing deals with these people to try and make sure that uh, he can control Germany. And he's getting the Catholic Church's approval with that. And then we have Night of the Long Knives, which is absolutely an event that involves terror. But also his deal with the army, he's going to pick them, shows that he's kind of compromising um, with the army. I just used the wrong colour there. Uh, that he's compromising with the army um, and that he's willing to support them in the future. And then when we've got the death of Hindenburg, obviously we have got um, the oath of loyalty, which is very much about him compromising with the army because he's going to give them money for rearmament. And there's also legal methods of him declaring himself Führer using the Enabling Act. So it's just worth maybe jotting down now a little subheading of legal methods and writing down which ones you could put in a paragraph on that. Terror, and then you write down which ones you could put with that. And compromise, and you write down some examples of compromise as well. So make sure you're comfortable with dictatorship before you move on. You've now got to the end of the dictatorship revision. It's worth double checking that you can answer all 13 of these questions before you move on. If you can't answer any of them, you might want to go back and watch those particular areas of this video, or you could even go back and look at your class notes as well to help you. Here are the answers to the questions that you've just had a look at. You might want to quickly check through your answers and make sure you've got them right before we move on to looking at control. If you do, pause it here and then you'll be able to move on afterwards. The next section you need to know about is how the Nazis controlled Germany. And if you were making a spider diagram, I would start a whole new one based on this topic and the three different main ways that they controlled Germany. So first of all, it's worth remembering that the Nazis never actually had more than 50% of the vote when they first came to power. Remember in 1932, they had 37% of the vote. And after the Reichstag fire in March 1933, they had 44% of the vote. So they didn't have everybody's support. But over time, they were able to become even more popular with the people. But they were also able to crush opposition effectively as well. Now, it's important to remember as well that people often now think of Nazi Germany as being a terror state, a police state, somewhere that people would be terrified to live in. But the majority of people in Germany at that point didn't view it as such. They genuinely believed that the Nazis improved Germany and made their lives better. Obviously, if you were somebody that was Jewish or you were somebody that didn't fit into their ideal person or their master race, then you wouldn't have benefited from the Nazis. But for some politically reliable and Aryan German people, they did benefit from Nazi policies. It's difficult for us to imagine now, but they were very popular for many different reasons. So we're going to talk first of all about the Nazis policies and how they were so popular with the ordinary people. Now, first of all, there were real incentives for being a loyal German citizen. If you were a member of the Nazi party, you would likely benefit from better jobs, better houses and special privileges. If you were a businessman, you were more likely to get a government order if you were actually an official member of the Nazi party. So people that hadn't been loyal supporters before often joined now anyway because they saw some benefit in it for themselves. Next, the Nazis did introduce things to try and win round the workers in particular through the KDF scheme, the strength through joy. This is where they offered workers things like free picnics, theatre trips and subsidised holidays, even going on places um, or going to places like Norway through cruises. And 10 million holidays were taken as a result of the KDF. It was incredibly popular and it made the workers feel valued. 
even people that traditionally supported left-wing parties like the SPD and KPD, some of them were won round by these kinds of policies. So we've got to remember, as odd as it sounds for us to think about now, when we think about the horror and things like the Holocaust, life at that time did feel like it was getting better under the Nazis. For instance, if we think about the job situation, when the Nazis came to power, there were six million people unemployed as a result of the Great Depression. Hitler did manage to get most of those people jobs. But we're going to see he cheated the system a little bit. They also reduced the crime rate. That's because they used things like concentration camps, which were really effective at stopping people committing those crimes. And they also provided people with a feeling of unity. Before, Germany had been incredibly divided and there'd been lots of attempted revolutions and people feeling very bitter at the state of Germany. Now people felt as if they had a kind of common goal and they had somebody they could follow in Hitler. Other people that liked the Nazis were quite often women. Lots of women liked the fact that they were being celebrated for being wives and mothers. They liked things like the marriage loans, they liked the motherhood cross and having medals for having children. So lots of the Nazis policies were incredibly popular with the people. And generally, people felt as if the Nazis actually delivered on their promises. They felt very let down by the politicians of Weimar. They felt that things like hyperinflation was the politician's fault. They hated things like the Treaty of Versailles. There was lots of things that they felt resentment over. And they felt that Weimar didn't deliver what it promised. Whereas for Hitler, Hitler had said that he was going to provide work and bread. And the people did think that he achieved that, even though it was the, at the expense of lots of Jewish people and women losing their jobs. If we think about the Treaty of Versailles, Hitler said that he was going to destroy it. And he did actually destroy most of the terms by doing things like rearming and recovering some lost territory in places like Czechoslovakia and reuniting with Austria. So for a lot of people, they saw him as being very different to the politicians of Weimar. And there was this real Hitler myth that was created, that Hitler was working tirelessly for the German people. And he was incredibly personally popular. Even people that didn't like the Nazi party in general were largely supportive of him as a politician. The next area that we need to know about for how the Nazis controlled Germany is propaganda and censorship. Now, we've already mentioned propaganda before, and we've thought about how it helped the Nazis win lots of votes before 1933. But this propaganda is different. And if you were asked to write about in an exam, you would have to mention different forms of propaganda here, because once they're in power, it's a lot more extensive. They have access to all the powers of the state and their propaganda changes as a result. So let's think about what kind of propaganda they're using and how they're controlling the German people with it. Well, first of all, we need to make sure that we understand who is in charge of this. And this is Joseph Goebbels. He's one of the key Nazis and helps the Nazis stay in power because he creates that Hitler myth, this idea of Hitler saving Germany that so many ordinary Germans bought into. He was also the head of the Reich Chamber of Culture, which oversaw all aspects of culture in Germany. For instance, Goebbels personally watched every single film before it was released into German cinemas to make sure that they were only pushing forward ideas that fitted with that ideology. For instance, quite often in films, they would have a Jewish character as the villain because that fit with their anti-Semitic agenda. They also used to burn things that didn't go with their agenda. For instance, if they didn't like books by a certain author, for instance, Remarque wrote a very famous book in the 1920s called All Quiet on the Western Front that was very anti-war. They burnt those kind of books because they liked to make war look like this glorious and heroic thing. They also burnt things like artwork that they didn't like, particularly that stuff that we saw in the 1920s that was very much about emotion rather than reality. So the Nazis basically destroyed any aspect of culture that they didn't like. 
for instance, they banned jazz music because it was associated with African Americans. But not only did they control culture, they also controlled things like the news. And this is a really important aspect to know about. So newspapers in Nazi Germany were heavily censored by the Nazis. They made sure that they always came off in a positive light and only positive news. And that helped them stay in power, because if you don't hear anything negative about them, you haven't got anything to criticise, anything to start that opposition. And the Nazis knew that, and that's why they wanted to control newspapers. And they were really clever about how they did it. What they did is they made all editors responsible for the content published in their newspapers. And editors are supposed to read all of the articles before they get published. This meant they effectively censored themselves, and so the Nazis could ensure that people only heard good news about them. So that was really good for them to stay in power because it convinced people that they were the right people to be in power because they were benefiting Germany. They also used the radio really effectively as well. And this is something that they didn't have access to before they came to power. Now they knew that the spoken word was very powerful, especially when you have fantastic um, speakers people like Hitler and Goebbels, people that could win round a crowd. So they decided to try and get every family to own a radio. And they created something called the People's Receiver, which was a subsidised, discounted radio. And occasionally, Hitler would then do speeches through the radio and therefore get his words into people's homes. Even people that didn't like the Nazis bought into the People's Receiver because that in that way they were going to get a discounted radio. And by 1939, 70% of households, households owned one. And they were grateful to the Nazis because that was seen as being a really um, luxurious item to own. And they were really grateful that they had it. Even if you wanted to avoid Hitler's speeches, it was almost impossible. Because the Nazis did things like putting up loudspeakers down streets where they would then play the speeches again and again afterwards as well. So the radio really did help the Nazis across their messages to ordinary people in their homes. You couldn't really avoid the Nazis. Another form of propaganda was actually the 1936 Berlin Olympic Games. The idea was that the Nazis wanted to show off how great Germany was to the rest of the world. And they had tried to do that by coming top of the medal table. You might remember from doing your lessons in the past about how Jesse Owens, an African-American athlete, was able to completely disprove the Nazi ideas of Aryan supremacy when he won things like the 200 metres. But nevertheless, propaganda and Nazi policies, remember, won over the vast majority of German people. Many people bought into the lies of propaganda that they were making Germany this perfect place. Lots of people really did um, like the Nazis and feel convinced by these messages. So pause the video here if you need to make some notes about how propaganda helps the Nazis stay in power. We've seen that the majority of the German people liked the Nazis. They liked their policies and they were convinced by propaganda that the Nazis were benefiting Germany. But for the small minority that decided that they wanted to oppose the Nazis, the Nazis tried to crush that opposition using terror. So we're going to talk through the four main forms of terror that you need to know about. First of all, we have the SS. And you might remember the SS from them being the people murdered the SA during the Night of Long Knives. It started off being very small in 1925, being Hitler's personal bodyguards, but they expanded and by 1935 there were 200,000 of them. By 1939 there were 250,000 of them. And there were lots of different branches with them. Um, some people have talked about the SS being a state within a state. Basically they were almost like a whole government within because there were so many different branches of them. Some members of the SS had jobs to hunt down opponents. Others of them, called the Death's Head Unit, ran things like concentration camps. Some of them were the Waffen SS, which was basically some of the elite armed forces. There were lots of different elements of the SS. We've just mentioned that they ran concentration camps, and remember that they had the first concentration camp 
from March 1933 at Dachau, just outside of Munich. His concentration camps at first were for opponents, people like the communists, and from 1936 the Nazis started arresting people for being homosexual, for being alcoholics, for being prostitutes. You could be sent there for doing things like writing some kind of anti-Nazi slogan, or owning a banned book, for instance, one by a Jewish author, or even suggesting that the Nazis were bad for business. So concentration camps were really effective for encouraging people to toe the line. The majority of people saw them as necessary for people that had gone against the Nazis. And remember, these are very different from the extermination camps that exist from 1942, where they put people that were Jewish and Roma and Sinti. So concentration camps were incredibly effective at stopping opposition. But the Nazis had something even more effective, and that was the Gestapo, the secret state police, which remember they had in Prussia from April 1933. Now the Gestapo terrified many people because you didn't know who the members of the Gestapo were. You didn't know where they were, were they listening to your conversation? And they had this reputation of being all knowing. It was a common phrase that people used to say in Nazi Germany was that you had to speak through a flower only saying good things. You have to really trust a person to criticise the Nazis in front of them because they could easily have been a member of the Gestapo or an informant and for even just saying one joke or comment you could be arrested and put in a concentration camp. Some parents even genuinely feared their own children would report them to the Gestapo. And the Gestapo deliberately arrest people in the middle of the night in order to kind of um, create that fear and make people very aware of their presence and that doing something wrong could lead to you suffering those same consequences. Now, the Gestapo is really important for helping the Nazis stay in power because it means it's really difficult to organise effective widespread opposition. Let's say I wanted to start an attempted revolution. Well, I'd need thousands upon thousands of people to join me. But every single time I tell somebody about that plan, I'm risking all of us being exposed and going to a concentration camp. So the Gestapo are incredibly important in helping the Nazis stop opposition. In actual reality, there are only 20,000 members of the Gestapo. And at its height, it only had 30,000. So it's actually a relatively small organisation for instance, in some cities, they had less than 10 agents. So actually, what made them so powerful was the informers, the fact that lots of German citizens used to tell on their friends and neighbours. And that's been found out after the Second World War. The final area for terror to know about is that the Nazis also controlled the courts. Even if you hadn't committed a crime, there was basically no way of getting out of it. Remember, since February 1933, when the Nazis passed the emergency decree after the Reichstag fire, people didn't have the same civil rights anymore, they didn't have freedom of speech, and the Nazis could arrest you without any evidence. There also wasn't a fair trial anymore, because the Nazis created something called the People's Courts, where you would have some normal judges, but you would also have Nazi judges that outnumbered them who would be able to sentence you. It even increased the amount of crimes that had the death penalty attached to them from three to 46. By the Second World War, you could be executed just for listening to the BBC. So terror was incredibly effective at silencing the few people that decided that they wanted to oppose the Nazis. So you need to make sure that you know about terror, but also make sure that you balance it with propaganda and popularity because terror wasn't needed for the majority of German people. Most people did conform. If you do get asked about how the Nazis controlled Germany, you can also mention if you want how they controlled the youth and how they controlled the churches. We'll talk about those details later on. You've just heard everything you need to know about control. On this slide, we've got 11 different questions, which hopefully you should now be able to answer. These are the really key points that you need to understand before you can move on. It's worth having a go at these either by writing down brief answers or answering them out loud, and you can check the answers on the next slide afterwards. Remember, if it's got a two or a three in brackets, it's worth more than one mark, and so you'd need to have either two or three things written down for that one.
So pause the video here and just check what you've learned so far. You can look at the answers after. On here we've got the answers. Pause the video if you want to check them before moving on. Well done for getting to the end of this part one revision video. Obviously, in today's lesson, we've gone through the basics of what you really need to know, the essential knowledge that is in your revision guide. Some of you might want to consolidate your knowledge and understanding now by making a couple of revision materials. This is really important, especially for the people that want to get the top grades, but also people that are still feeling a little bit unsure about the topics. And if you struggled with answering those short answer test questions, you definitely want to try and go through and make these materials. Now, if it was me, I would be making two different revision clocks and I would use these 12 headings that I've listed here. I'd make one about how Hitler became a dictator, and I would look at all these different 12 events that you can see here. But I'd also make sure I was talking about how these events led to Hitler becoming dictator. I wouldn't just put down what they were. I'd also make sure I thought about why would that help Hitler become a dictator. And that should have been something that you covered within your class notes. I'd also do a separate one on how Hitler controlled Germany. Now, obviously this revision video talked about the main three forms and what he did, but it's definitely worth going back to your lesson notes to find out a little bit more detail, because obviously I've done it in a very concise way on this video. So if you were going to do the one about control, it's definitely worth going back and looking at your previous notes. And don't forget, because this is something that we have covered through online learning, there is lots of different videos that have information. If you look up Miss Monroe on YouTube, you'll find that there's a lesson on propaganda, there's a lesson on terror, and there's a lesson on popularity. And you can always go back and watch those if you want to get some more detailed notes on that topic. So it'd be a very wise idea if you can do to make some revision notes using these headings, and that way you'll be ready to get a grade nine in the exams. Well done for your hard work today.